thank you, thank you very much to all of you. Really, it was really fun to listen to and really entertaining and inspiring and educational. <laughs> but I have one question to see. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Singring. <laughs> uh, because what you discussed is extremely relevant for what happens in Norway these days. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of this, but there is a huge debate in Norway because the birth centers in the small communities are being closed down the one after the other. The government has worked intensively <laughs> those last two years to close down uh, hospitals, birth centers, specialist centers, etc., etc., in the name of economy, of course. And uh, so the midwives have been out in the public debate discussing this. The local community uh, has been discussing this. But um, one argument that has been used to close down these birth centers is that um, in a small birth center where you don't get enough births in a year, it doesn't allow you to have the kind of expertise and knowledge that you should have. So the argument has been we, it needs to be centralized in bigger centers where the staff can have the, um, the knowledge and the experience they need. And this argument has been used by some midwives too. And I know this is contrary to what you've been saying, but I would like to hear your opinion on this and how, how do you see this argument? I think, I think, I think this argument has been used in many, many different countries, always the same. Uh, the Midwest don't have uh, enough birth per year. But if you have been working as a midwife for 10, 15, 20 years, and you have had a uh, hundred or thousand of birth, is it then okay to have only 10 one year? Or should you have 100 every year or 50 every year? What was the right number? And I can say that out loud that I totally disagree with that because uh, most of uh, most of the high risk uh, w pregnancy uh, women in high risk pregnancy they have been already transferred to the high technology hospitals before or in the beginning of labor. Uh, if you are an experienced midwife you know, in most of the cases, you know in the beginning of the labor that that woman should be transferred. Uh, it's very rare that something happens like that, like heart attack or something. It's very rare. And the heart attack also, uh, um, uh, what should I say, um, happens in the high technology hospitals like like uh, I have attended a few home births in my town in Akureyri and I have said that they are as safe because I choose the women very well, what women I say yes to home birth with uh, and very often the obstetrician is asleep at home during the night when I am assisting women to give birth at a hospital. So in a small community it gets uh, uh, for me, it gets less time to go to the hospital than the obstetrician to get dressed and go to the hospital. And I do not agree that you need 50, 100 deliveries a year. I think we, they are, what should I say, some, some of the decision has been made because they are afraid of childbirth. They don't have the information they need uh, to take the decision to close down delivery wards or not. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone else want to comment on, on, on that before we take the next question? We have uh, another question in the, in the audience. Yeah, thank you. I'm Catherine from the local hospital here, but I have a question in the other end of the life specter uh, regarding the palliative care. I was wondering, it was really interesting uh, what you were explaining about, but I was wondering about the numbers because you had an increase in number of patients receiving home care, palliative care, but you have this exact same numbers of people dying at home. Did you see that as a problem or are you doing anything to uh, 
give them the continuous care so they can also do the dying, so to speak, at home? Yes. I was, I was expecting this question. <laughs> the thing is, y there are so many different, and I have practiced the answer also. <laughs> but there are so many different aspects of it, and there are so many different reasons for why patients do not die at home. And there are research, uh, uh, res researches on why do people spend their last 24 hours in hospital and die there? Why don't they die at home? Um, the, you, in my experience, I can only say that because we don't have any research which are something we can say, this is the reason. We need more resources and we will probably never have one answer. But in my experience is that uh, in the last maybe three days or even the last um, 24 hours, there are often um, changes, bodily and psychological changes, which are unbearable for the, for the family. They, and also for the family, the family has nothing more to, to give. So they, I never use the word give up because no one is giving up anything. But what we do in, in, the sur in this kind of service, we, we prepare uh, as soon as we know that this uh, traditional palliative care is changing into more uh, care of the dying and end of life care. We prepare the family for that uh, it is n normal, it is all right, and if uh, the patient has to go into hospital uh, in the end. So we, we try to uh, help the family to cope with that possibility because this is really difficult for the family having to do that after maybe some months of being the, the prime carers for their loved one. So it's a very sensitive, <laughs> it's a very sensitive issue. It's a really sensitive time in this process, the whole process. But this is the reality that there is something there. We, we, as you said, we should focus more on. Is there anything more we could do? One thing we we could do, but we are not able to do, is that we would simply have to move into the home to be there 24 hours on shifts. That would change this number of home deaths dramatically. So, but we can't do that. We, we shouldn't do that. <coughs> and because we have uh, talked about here that you need to keep a certain professional distance. That's very difficult often in this job really difficult but we need to do it <coughs> and once in these years I have been in this uh, clinical part of this specialty once I felt that they talked to me like I was their daughter they don't talk to me as a, I'm their nurse it's not a really nice feeling to get <laughs> how should I turn around you know and it happened like that, there was something, um, a critical uh, moment there, and they said, phone the doctor, phone the doctor. But this was something we nurses do. But I was becoming one of the family completely. So, so uh, if we were able to move in and stay like one of the families and being a nurse as well, <coughs> this, this number would change. So. Thank you for noticing that because it's uh, uh, this is something we really need to focus on. Yeah, uh, there's some opportunity for more questions. Yes, uh, Kerst. Uh, just a short comment uh, due to that. Uh, I'm uh, Geert Mulberg coming from uh, Greenland. Uh, I think uh, it's also important to think about uh, what is the ceremony after the death. Uh, and 
and uh, that have a great impact in many families in uh, in Greenland. But uh, because the ceremony after the death is important to be a part of where you are living and not a part of the hospital, so it gives some possibility of changing uh, the ceremony of, uh, of death, which is important in, in our area of, uh, of where people are living. So uh, we want to, to die in our home if mm -hmm. possible, uh, because uh, what happened after we, we are dead is of great mm -hmm. importance for mm -hmm. the family. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to Yes, if you comment? want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. This is one of the most important parts of the, this service, to die in your own environment because, because of what comes after. Uh, could we not, we who live in these um, d small communities all over, could we not just do something about it? Could, I, w I would happily come to Greenland and talk to you about it because this is so important. Because the patient has been home for maybe three months or more or, or less, and then he says farewell in the hospital. Acute environment. Uh, in our local hospitals and all many of other hospitals, they have made some sort of small <laughs> palliative care unit or unit where it's peaceful. But it is an acute environment. Uh, people are not skilled to take in a patient. They have never nursed. They don't even know him. And then the patient dies. It's just not the same. I have also been present at a home where the family wanted a coffin in the home. And they wanted to do everything uh, except the burial. The fu funeral was the traditional way. It's it's uh, what can we do? I will just ask you here. What can we do? May I ask a question instead? Of yeah, I, because mm. I, before get uh, yeah. raised this question, I had the same yes. thing in my mind about, yeah. for example, might yeah. be disagreements within the family about uh, how long, for example, a body can stay in the home, uh -huh. and uh, are there comments or uh, who gets to actually control that for these kinds of choices? Yeah. So we, yeah. did we have responses to Elizabeth's questions? Yes. Yeah. I don't have the solution, but I think that the giving the family the security that they can call somebody that they know, or at least a, a bundle of people that they know, any time of day, around the clock, and then they immediately can come and help them, and also help with the big problems that you mentioned are in the last, very last uh, stages before you die. Yeah. I think that would be a really a great relief to the family, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. maybe we should put a lot of focus on that. And I think they've yes. been quite good doing that in the Faroe Islands. I think they could do more, yeah. but the, I think that would be part of the key. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I just want to add here that it's so complicated. Maybe one or two persons in a family of ten all gathered together, two says, that's enough, that's enough. Why don't you transfer him to hospital. What are you going to, you know, we can't do anymore. Why don't you do anything? S say to me, I'm the nurse. I control this, but I don't control it. I control it. I do what people want me to do. And then there is the wife and the daughter said, no, 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 don't listen to him. No, he's staying home. He's dying here. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> let's, let's move on in, uh, yeah. because of we have uh, don't have I, much time. And if I you want to uh, comment yes, on, on this. Yes, I want to comment on yeah. this because I have a, a PhD student that are just studying uh, end of life care before, during, and after what is happening mm -hmm. from a Sami per perspective. Yes. And that is very important, I think, that you need more research about the yes. different um, pe periods of oh, yes. dying so you can uh, adapt and, and be helpful in oh. that uh, oh, yes. situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I think the only thing standing between all of you and the lunch is. Uh, my decision of <laughs> continuing or not. <laughs> so I know there are lots of questions. I, I, I just I, I know that this has been extremely interesting, 
And just I want to thank all of you presenters for your terrific presentations here today. And thank all of you for your very good uh, uh, qu uh, questions and participation. And so we will uh, continue here at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>